I'm Doug Boyd, director of the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky Libraries. OMS is designed to give your users an easy-to-use, intuitive online experience using oral history. Using OMS empowers your users to more effectively and efficiently discover information in your online oral history interviews and collections by connecting users from a search result in a transcript or an index to the corresponding moment in the audio or video. Indexing is easy. As you listen to an interview, you can tag the important moments. With each segment that you create, you can include a ton of searchable text, a title, a partial transcript of the segment, a summary of the segment, keywords and subjects. You can also include a hyperlink to say a related photograph or web page, and you can include GPS coordinates, which will show your users related locations on a map while the interview continues. When you begin to use OMS to index your interviews, you might have a lot of questions. Some of these questions will be simple, mechanical questions, but some will be more complex. This tutorial goes beyond the basic how to index question to explain how the Nun Center answers more subjective questions like, where should I place a timestamp? And what should I include within a segment? How do I construct a good title? Where do subjects come from? What should I include as a keyword? How much should I include in my synopsis? Where can I find GPS coordinates? And what sort of links should I include in my index? In order to understand the philosophy behind the decisions the Nun Center makes when indexing, we'll show you a segment from an interview and demonstrate the choices we've made while indexing this segment and explain the reasoning behind them. So, um, I've gotten to know so many people from all the other distilleries and um, you know, it's kind of a sisterhood because the women run the visitor centers. So I've gotten to know a lot of really nice people and, and attended some really excellent events with the Bourbon Festival. Now, Olivia, everything always comes around to this. Are there any ghosts out at Wild Turkey? Yes, there are. There are many ghosts out there. <laughs> Um, when I started in the visitor center, as I said, I did all I had was a, a walkie-talkie. I always felt like I had someone that watched over me and protected me, and I still really feel that way. We started doing some paranormal investigations back in the fall last year, and we had some positive reactions. Um, we actually had some pictures of an apparition. It was a gentleman that I knew, I believe, um, that died while he was working. Um, he, we, I worked with his daughter. We were very good friends and we were always having a good time at work and we went around the corner and he said, now you girls behave and admonished us. And when we went up to break, people started saying to my friend, you need to come here. And she thought they were playing with her and she'd say, no, no. And and they said, your dad's down and he's gone. So um, I believe that's who the spirit is that's in the shipping department. At the distillery, we have an apparition. Uh, we've used the equipment that the paranormal people use and apparently uh, I'm having some real conversations with him. <laughs> um, he responds very well to me. Uh, when they take my pictures, when I'm talking to him, they get orbs and so forth. Uh, also, in the distillery, the first time when we were doing an investigation, we had a medium with us and he said, you need to go up, you need to go up. Well, we went up to the top floor and I looked up and on the rafter it said Rippy, but my name is spelled R-I-P-Y. And my great-grandfather had changed it to R-I-P-Y, but it had previously been R-I-P-P-Y. So I looked up and saw that, and I said, Roger Allen Rippey, did you do that? And they had tape recorders going, and I, the thing is, is that I am not a paranormal person. This was all an introduction to me. And I, I just said, Roger Allen Rippey, did you do that? 
And then I saw a name of a boy that I worked with there. And I said, Keith, are you with him? So when they played the tapes back, they got an EVP that said pretty clearly, uncle. And then it said, you remember me. So that was pretty, very interesting. I have decided over the last few months that I have a lot more dead friends than I do living ones because they seem to be very attracted to me. We are going to continue to do paranormal tours at the distillery, and we had very good feedback from it. So I believe they're there. What about ghosts in this house? Well, they're here too. <laughs> are they following you? I, I, I have a pretty big following according to this medium. Um, they did an investigation in here one night. My cousin George was here. I wasn't here when they did the first investigation, but I did get uh, copies of the EVPs and they asked who built this house and very plainly it says, I did. <laughs> and then he says, can you tell me your name? And it sounds like it says, yes, it's Tom Rippey. Then they also took some pictures back in the hall, and there's an apparition of a man that's very, very tall. We all, I had a, my medium friend came here on a tour one day, and he kept talking about the big, tall man, the big, tall man. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Of course, T.B. Rippey died long before I was born. And uh, he kept saying, this guy's really big. So my brother is not a real believer, and he was not paying any attention. And R.J. said, who in your family would be really big? And Tom B. turned around and said, well, my grandfather Rippy was 6'5". Well, I didn't even know that. And uh, R.J. said, well, he's standing over there in the corner. <laughs> real happy you're here. <laughs> so uh, apparently he's here a lot. If you were to look at the business today and having the history that you have in the business, what do you see for it for the future? Oh, I think that it's got, it's got so much opportunity. I see it going up. I think um, Americans are beginning to really drink quality products and they are discovering that uh, there's something real special about bourbon. In Ohm's indexing, the timestamp dictates where each segment begins and therefore determines the introduction the user will receive to the segment. This part of the tutorial not only describes how to place a timestamp in Ohm's, but also covers the philosophy behind the timestamp placement and different placement strategies that repositories may wish to use. A timestamp marks the precise moment within an interview at which a segment begins. To create a timestamp, locate the desired moment within the interview and click the Tag Now button. When you press Tag Now, the interview will automatically jump back a few seconds and the Tag Data module will appear. The screen includes player controls as well as the segment metadata fields. The buttons located in the Ohm's editing window are designed to help you place the timestamp in the exact location you need. There are standard play and stop buttons which start and pause the interview. There's also the jump ahead button and a jump back button, which move the interview forward and back 15 seconds respectively. The button that is the farthest to the left will allow you to return to the current timestamp for the segment. While indexing, it's often difficult to know when a new segment needs to begin until the moment has already passed. For this reason, the Ohm system rewinds the interview a few seconds in order for you to be able to tag the correct moment. It's important to tag the specific second in the interview that begins the new question or statement. Do not leave silence at the beginning of a segment or your user may be confused as to whether the segment has actually begun playing. It's equally important not to cut off the beginning of the question or the statement as it seems sloppy and does not give the user a good introduction to the segment. Place the timestamp precisely as the desired line begins. Everything always comes around run the visitor centers. So I've gotten to know a lot of really nice people and, and attended some really excellent events with the Bourbon Festival. 
Now, Olivia, everything always comes around to this. When placing a timestamp in an interview, you can see the time of the recording that is currently playing to the right of the editing window. This will help you more accurately judge when to click the Update Time button, as well as help you judge how long the segment has been playing and whether a new section is needed. There are several options available when choosing where to place a timestamp within a segment. When indexing in OMS, the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History chooses to place timestamps at the beginning of an interviewer's question instead of before in response. This allows each segment to be more cleanly broken down by topic and also creates a more complete segment. It also solves the common problem of a question receiving a simple yes or no response. Without the question included, it would be difficult for a user beginning with the segment to understand the context of the response. Placing the timestamp before the question also highlights the role of the interviewer within the oral history. Although the interviewee is generally the main subject or focus of an interview, it's important to remember that the interviewer influences and guides the interview and plays a major part in the final product. Using the interview with Olivia Rippey is an example. Let's look at where we place the timestamp for this segment and why. So I've gotten to know a lot of really nice people and, and attended some really excellent events with the Bourbon Festival. Now, Olivia, everything always comes around to this. Are there any ghosts out at Wild Turkey? We have chosen to begin this segment at the 18 minute and 54 second mark. This means that the segment does not begin at the actual question posed by the interviewer, but includes the dialogue that leads up to the question, since it was clearly part of the flow of the conversation of this segment. We also included it in this segment because it would not make sense to include it at the end of the previous segment, since it's the lead-in to a new topic. Timestamps do not necessarily need to correlate to an interviewer's question. Some oral histories contain very little input by the interviewer or contain long stretches of the interviewee speaking. It's perfectly acceptable to place a timestamp where you, the indexer, feels it makes the most sense, whether it's before an interviewer's question or simply when an interviewee changes topics. And uh, RJ said, well, he's standing over there in the corner. <laughs> Real happy you're here. <laughs> so uh, apparently he's here a lot. If you were to look at the business today and having the history that you have in the business, what do you see for it for the future? We have chosen to end the segment prior to this question in order to begin a new segment about the future of the bourbon industry. It's easy to create a title in Ohms. What's harder is creating a good title that conveys as much information about the segment as possible, while not being overly wordy or confusing to the user. When creating segment titles, it's important to make the message clear. This means not using slang, overly technical terms, clever terms of phrase, or ambiguous references. For example, a segment called Good Things Come in Small Packages would be better titled The Development of Blanton's Brand and Other Small Batch Bourbons. The most important question to ask when creating a title is, what's the main point of the segment? A good rule of thumb is to consider adding a topic to the title if the interviewee talks about the subject for at least a third of the segment. Although this is not a hard and fast rule, it can be helpful to think about, especially when you first begin to learn to index. If the segment does not have one main topic, but instead two or more smaller topics, consider including more than one topic by separating them with a slash in the title. For example, in the interview with Olivia Rippey, we have chosen to name a segment Advice for Women in the Bourbon Industry slash Cooking with Bourbon, since both are equally important subjects within the segment. Remember that although you can include multiple subjects within the title of a segment, it's not necessary to provide that level of detail for each segment, especially when one overarching title can be used. It's also good to ask yourself, would someone who has not yet listened to this interview understand what this segment is about? Often the title may be the only information a viewer sees about the segment, so it's important to ensure that the main point of the segment is obvious in the viewer. When creating titles, the Nun Center chooses to capitalize only the first word of the title unless it includes proper nouns. 
It's unnecessary to include the interviewee's name in the segment title. Users will understand that since this person is giving the interview, most of the segments will be about or pertain to them. For example, in the interview with Olivia Rippey from the Kentucky Bourbon Tales Oral History Project, one segment is titled Career at Wild Turkey Distillery instead of Olivia Rippey's Career at Wild Turkey Distillery. Subjects and keywords are used to increase the searchability of an interview by providing representative and descriptive terms that researchers may be looking for when searching through the interviews. I view the subjects field in indexing to be used for control vocabularies, while the keywords field I generally reserve for mapping natural language to concepts, using words that the interviewee uses themselves. The Nunn Center views the subjects category as a field that should be strictly controlled. We use only Library of Congress subject headings in order to maintain consistency across all interviews and collections. Although subjects may also help users understand the content of a segment, their purpose is to provide a common thread between many interviews across all collections. The Nunn Center follows the Library of Congress conventions on spellings and capitalizations for subjects. The interview with Olivia Rippey from the Kentucky Bourbon Tales Oral History Project was indexed at what we call Level 3 for the segment Paranormal Activity at the Wild Turkey Distillery and the T.B. Rippey House. We have chosen several subjects from the Library of Congress list of subject headings. These include apparitions, distilleries dash dash Kentucky, ghosts, haunted encounters, haunted houses, haunted places, parapsychology, and spirits. We have chosen these headings to highlight the locations within the segment, a distillery and a house in Kentucky, as well as the main topic of the segment, the paranormal activities said to occur in the distillery. Looking up subjects on the Library of Congress authorities, we discovered that while ghosts is an authorized subject heading, paranormal phenomena and paranormal activity were not. The references for these terms lead us to the term parapsychology, which we have included. We also tried synonyms and other terms related to the word ghost in the search function of the Library of Congress authorities, which leads us to the terms haunted encounters, haunted houses, spirits, and apparitions. You do not need to spend much time searching for subjects in the Library of Congress subject headings. Indexing is supposed to be a more efficient way of enhancing access to an interview. If you find that you're spending too long searching for subjects, consider using a small list of subjects that you already know and adding the topics you're unsure of as keywords instead. Whereas subjects are used more sparingly and come from a predetermined list of subject headings, keywords are used more liberally and are generally based upon natural language used within the interview itself. Because the keywords are created from the words of the interviewee, when indexing, you should use quotation marks for nicknames, esoteric or regional terms, and unusual phrases. The Nunn Center encourages indexers to use terms that are as specific as they deem necessary. Since keywords are used to compensate for the lack of detail in the control vocabularies of the subject field, although keywords should be less strictly controlled than subjects, it's still beneficial to create your own keyword thesaurus for each collection of interviews with a common topic. We like to add the common words to a spreadsheet, which can be added to OMS as a keyword thesaurus or used separately to copy terms into the OMS indexing module. Not all keywords need to come from this list, but a controlled vocabulary can help you keep track of personal names, company names, and places. For our Kentucky Bourbon Tales Oral History Project, the Nunn Center created both a Library of Congress-based thesaurus for our subjects and a keyword thesaurus of distilleries, distillers, and product names used throughout the collection. This allows us to be consistent about the correct names and spellings of words used throughout multiple interviews. To determine the keywords that you should assign to the interview, there are several methods you can follow. One approach is to think in terms of numbers. If a topic makes up at least 20% of a segment, you should consider using it as a keyword. You should also add synonyms or variations that you think a user may search for. For example, in the interview with Olivia Rippey, in the segment on paranormal activity, we not only included the term ghosts, but also spirits and apparitions. It's also a good idea, time permitting, to include both acronyms and full words for terms. For example, include both World War Roman numeral 2 and WW Roman numeral 2, as well as spelled out World War 2 and WW accompanied by the number 2. 
This ensures that no matter how the users search for the topic of World War II, they'll locate the relevant segments. Along with the terms that make up approximately 20% of the segment, you can also include the terms that you think future researchers may be interested in. For instance, in the Kentucky Bourbon Tales interviews, the interviewees often speak about specific bourbons and products like Wild Turkey American Honey or Woodford Reserve Single Barrel. Although these terms do not comprise 20% of the segment, they may be something a user may wish to search for and will provide more detailed information about the segment. Another method for choosing keywords is to choose parts of the segment that are unique and interesting. This should not be the sole method you choose to create keywords, and you should still include the main topics of the segment. But this is a great way to point out interesting features of the segment and to differentiate it from other segments in the interview, especially if the entire interview only covers one or two large topics. For the interview with Olivia Rippey, we've chosen most of the keywords because they comprise the main topic of the segment. We've also chosen keywords for locations that the stories occur in, such as the Visitor Center and the Shipping Department of the Wild Turkey Distillery, as well as the T.B. Rippey House. We chose to include the name Roger Allen Rippey because Olivia Rippey believes this is the spirit she was communicating with and because she tells a story about Roger Rippey that comprises a good portion of the segment. Although the Wild Turkey Distillery is a major topic of the segment, we have chosen not to include it as a keyword since it's already part of the title. The information entered in the various fields should complement each other and should avoid overlap as much as possible. When entering keywords, the Nunn Center typically pluralizes generic terms, as the Library of Congress does, for example, photographs and visitors' centers. This enables users searching for ghosts and those searching for ghosts to locate the terms in your interview. The Nunn Center also chooses to capitalize only the first word of each keyword, unless the keyword is a proper noun, but this is a matter of preference and local policy. A synopsis in OMS is used to provide further clarity on the segment and the information you have entered in other fields. It is useful for expressing concepts that are too complex to be conveyed as keywords alone. In a synopsis, the Nunn Center generally refers to the interviewee and the interviewer by last name. We choose to write them this way because we feel that using first names only is too informal. If two people in the same interview have the same last name, a first initial should be added to distinguish between the two. For example, O. Rippey and T. Rippey. When writing a synopsis, it's important to recall the level of indexing you have chosen for that interview. If you're indexing at level one, a synopsis is unnecessary. A level two index should have a brief synopsis, generally two to three sentences, and a level three index should contain a more detailed synopsis. When writing a synopsis for a level two interview, you should always mention the main points of the segment. Generally, if a topic is in the title, it should also be explained further in the synopsis. The synopsis can also be used to point out interesting things that the interviewee says during the segment or unique topics that you think a future researcher may search for. A level three synopsis is longer and more detailed than a level two synopsis, providing more detail about the segment and the topics within, but still should not be a substitute for listening to the segment. Ohm's indexing now includes GPS coordinates, but it requires that they be written in a specific way in order for them to properly link to a map when clicked. These coordinates cannot have symbols and must be written in decimal degrees, which look like this. Latitude data must be listed before longitude data and must be separated by a comma and one space. Next, you will need to write a description for the coordinates you have entered. How you write these descriptions is up to you, just be consistent through your interviews. The Nunn Center chooses to use Library of Congress standard when writing GPS descriptions. For example, the GPS description for the city of Lawrenceburg, Kentucky will be entered as Lawrenceburg KY period in parentheses. There are several methods of acquiring GPS coordinates to use in your index, each with their own strengths and limitations. The Ohm's Index also includes hyperlinks. Hyperlinks do not need to be used in every segment and should link to photographs, videos, or websites that are directly relevant to the interview. Links to websites especially should link to a specific page with information related to the segments and not to a general homepage or website. Don't make the users search through the website on their own. Try to lead them directly to the information you think would be useful. If you're linking directly to a photograph, 
the OMS viewer will overlay that photograph in a lightbox presentation while the interview continues. The user then closes the lightbox and continues to listen or watch the interview. If you're linking to a page with an image on the page, your browser should simply open a new tab. When the user is finished, they simply close the tab and return to the OMS viewer. Indexing is a subjective process. Each indexer will make different choices about keywords, subjects, and timestamps. Each repository or institution can create their own set of standards and procedures for creating an index that works best with their resources and goals. As long as the information indexed is useful to future users, there's really no wrong way to index an oral history. Enjoy using OMS, and good luck on your oral history project. Thank you.